bathroom. Get locked in there. Don't panic. Don't scream. It's kind of embarrassing for you. Just push on it and lean in. There's a picture of Cheryl Sandberg and lean in as a reminder. Lean into the door and you'll get out. <laughs> or yell and we'll come and help. So, uh, Walnut Street Labs, I see some new faces. That's great. Thank you for coming. I forgot today was election day. As usual, we have people come in very end or very before. Uh, Startup Meetup is its uh, mission is to promote innovation in the region because there's so much of it out here, and traditional media has kind of sucked at doing a good job of educating the masses on what's going on. It's kind of like you just heard about Cold Light was acquired by PTC. PTC acquired ThingWorks a year ago. That's two hundred million dollars spent in Chester County. I guess Cold Light's not Chester County, but pretty close. So that's like an enormous play, and so we don't have any of those people here today. We have Bill Atley from my pipeline. Uh, let's give him a round of applause for coming. <laughs> so I'm inviting speakers here to kind of share their story. We live stream it onto YouTube. The whole thing is recorded then and made available to anybody who visits our channel. Mike is doing second camera. He does the summaries that goes across social media. Jared is taking pictures. She does a photo album that goes across social. So if you see any of it come through, uh, please share it. Uh, we've been experimenting with Meerkat and Periscope too. And then is live tweeting. And Jesse does a blog. So if you think about that, I kind of sometimes think we're a media organization uh, and we're exploring that a bit. This is our 70 or 72nd, definitely at least our 70th startup meetup in a row. We are booked into October or November, so it looks like we're going to end up doing at least 104 in a row. We do this, kind of this, on Wednesday nights from 7 to 10. It's called Night Owls. And it's not formal. You can come and work on projects, meet people, but we've been doing demos every other week, so more technical, hey, I'm doing this, I'm struggling with this, right? I figured out this, what do you think? So uh, we have uh, someone from back office thinking doing a demo tomorrow night. Uh, last thing, we just finished uh, our big event with Unisys. So we had 18 teams submit a user interface for their enterprise security app called Stealth. And we expected four teams. And so that was crazy. We're doing a post again <coughs> tomorrow and hopefully do a, another project. So. Uh, We'll announce that when, when we get there. But the videos, the, the final videos are coming out. If you haven't seen it, you'll see it. Uh, thanks to our sponsors, the Economic Development Council, uh, for hooking us up on a number of fronts. Uh, Fox Rothschild has our legal back. They're great. Terry has office hours that you can schedule. Uh, Igniter TV, <coughs> AKA Sean Kaminsky, doing live stream. Uh, for free for a year and a half. Thank you very much. Uh, Hankin Group runs a wet lab in Eagle View. They're like us, but for scientists. Uh, and Brennan for hooking us up with a stand-up desk. Next week, thank you, Jesse, for a quick note. Next week, we have... Last week, oh, we had Ted Manns last week, founder of uh, SnipSnap. First kind of consumer mobile app that got brought up out of Philly. Next week is Michelle McKeon, uh, founder of Autism Express. Do you want to talk about that? Did you book her? I did. Um, she is friends with a couple people in uh, Philadelphia, and um, she's really in, in an interesting space. Um, but it's basically for um, it's like an adv advocacy startup for people with autism. Um, and it works with, um, she's a teacher from a public high school in Philadelphia, and um, that's all I got for now, but it, it's an interesting startup, and uh, it's really the only one that I'm aware of in the Philly tech scene um, that is geared towards um, learning um, and products uh, geared towards learning of people with, uh, with autism, so okay. it'll be interesting. All right.
So let's uh, turn our attention to Bill. Thank you for taking time out of your schedule. I can't lie to you. A thriving, growing, large uh, software company in Exton. And you'll probably give us a, a, a snapshot of that. But yep. tell us about your story, and then we'll do the Q&A. The crowd's here love to, to challenge you with all sorts of questions. So whenever you're ready for q and I'll come back up and help facilitate. So I can't swear now that I'm on camera? Is that no, you can. You can. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. How many people would consider themselves an entrepreneur or have entrepreneurial tendencies? There's a big um, misconception that entrepreneurs are risk takers. And I, when I say that is because they really calculate risk differently than most of us. People don't just jump off of buildings and start companies and, and uh, fly away and hope that they land safely. They really figure out whether they can actually make something work and they, they analyze that way, f um, way more than most people think they are. How many people, show of hands, store their ketchup in the refrigerator? That's it, huh? You know, nowhere on a ketchup bottle does it say ref uh, refrigerated after opening. In fact, you know this because you go to a restaurant and it sits on the counter and you pour it on your french fries and you put it back and it's been sitting on that, that table for days and weeks, right? But we all run home and put our ketchup in the refrigerator. Do you know why you do that? Who's got an idea? Okay. Keeps it off the counter. Keeps it off the counter. Marketing. Marketing. The only reason why you do it is because your mother did it that way. <laughs> right? You are absolutely a creature of your habits. And even though I tell you <clears throat> logically that you do not need to refrigerate it, no one's going to go home and put it in their cabinet just because I said so today. Right? So a misconception about entrepreneurs is that we love change and it's, we're going to change the world. The world doesn't want to be changed. Neither do you. Right? You have to be able to convince people to shift their lives over a period of time and then get them to where you want to be as an entrepreneur, right? So we'll, ex we'll explore a little bit about that today. Uh, I want to first start off by saying, what do you think these guys have in common? What do you see amongst all of them? Success. Success, okay. Advertising. Advertising. Internet. 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 The reality is they're all disruptors, right? But they're all aggregators. They all either aggregate music, real estate, uh, hotels, uh, books, travel, all those things, they, they've, they've aggregated things together. And that's really what iPipeline is. We basically are, uh, were bought in because we were not like other industries. Uh, we're a very fragmented industry with very complex products. Uh, we have insurance agents that sell things because they can't explain things to consumers really easy without these agents. And they also use a lot of different software tools in order to, to be able to accomplish their job. I started off as a life insurance agent. I sold about 6,000 insurance policies. So deep knowledge and not technology, in fact, I don't really know anything about technology, but a deep knowledge of how something works in the industry of insurance. And ultimately, what our job is to do is dramatically improve how insurance is sold as a company. So uh, if you think back 30 years ago, um, most of you may realize that there was a career agent that you might represent uh, that sold about 70% of all insurance in the United States. About 30% of that was done by this independent broker. The difference is a career agent can only sell for one insurance company and a broker can sell for multiple insurance companies. When I entered in the business, uh, these numbers were exactly like this, but then they began to flip-flop. And today it's actually now an independent agent sells 70% of insurance. Why? Because most of the people like yourself were able to go online and figure out that there are better rates out there, just like you could find about car insurance and cars and things that you could shop on. We could no longer keep that a secret from the consumer and just sell one product. So ultimately, when all these insurance brokers left and they went to go work at the loft of their house, uh, they were challenged by uh, insurance companies saying, hey, sell for me, sell for me, sell for me. They still wanted you as an independent agent to represent them, even though you were uh, independently um, on your own. And what we had struggles with in the early 90s was that everything was paper-based. We'd put forms in filing cabinets. They would vary by state and product by carrier. We'd have these little CDs that they would have to load and reload on your laptop that would have the, the quoting for each insurance company. So imagine if I was going to quote something for a customer who's 45-year-old male, I'd have to put that in five, six, seven, eight times into different CDs and repeat that process. And that just sucked up an enormous amount of time as an insurance agent for myself. So what we ultimately did was we said, well, if you went out to an internet site and be able to do things in real time, and this is like 1996, people were like calling it the World Wide Web, and there was this thing called a PDF, and you would download it through something called AOL, and it would take 15 minutes for a PDF to download, and people were like, oh my gosh, I can go to my filing cabinet easier. 
right? But ultimately, that form might be wrong. We said if you go out to all these different insurance company websites, you're going to have then have to log in, you're going to have to navigate those sites, and you're going to have to figure out where those forms are. So why don't the insurance companies give it to iPipeline as a big repository? Think about Travelocity, right? We would aggregate all the insurance content in the United States and the world. And then what we would do is we would syndicate that out to other people's portals. Nobody comes to iPipeline.com to get information. What they do is they go to Bank of America, Morgan Stanley. They go to big uh, wirehouses, names that you would know. And as an insurance agent, when you've logged in there for the day, you're actually pulling down content inside of iPipeline's repository. And there's, we have about 1,200 distributors in the United States who do that. So traffic then from the eyeball traffic from the agents shifted to these distributor sites and insurance companies knew that we had sucked traffic away from their websites and ultimately in order to get shelf space inside the distributor site, uh, they wanted to be almost like a grocery store. They had to be able to be seen inside these different portals. Um, but they didn't want to have to go manage all these portals to make sure that people change their quotes and change their rates. So they basically said if I give it to iPipeline once, uh, they'll be able to filter it and get it out to the world for us and that's how the company began, right? Um, ultimately, the way we charge is a subscription. Insurance companies pay us to put their information into our repository because they want the eyeball traffic. If they're not seen inside these portals, they can't sell insurance effectively. Uh, we then charge people and distributors to actually see that content. So I always laugh. Insurance companies give me a form that I charge them to put in there, and then I sell those forms back out to distributors. And then insurance agents like TurboTax fill out our forms electronically. We correct their mistakes. We do electronic signature and electronic submission, and we submit that back to the insurance company so people don't have to rekey things over and over again, and we charge them a transaction charge. And then we also power that same content on their website charging over and over and over again for the same form in multiple places and that's how the punk company has grown to hundred million dollars in sales and have hundreds of thousands of insurance agents and insurance companies using our software so our job was not just to analyze forms but we had to look at everything along the process quoting underwriting forms straight through processing and do everything really well so that we could basically cut some costs for the insurance industry. So today, we have 150 insurance companies, 1,200 distributors, 475,000 insurance agents that touch our software, and millions of consumers who are ultimately uh, getting quotes and forms and those types of things electronically uh, through their insurance agents. So these are some of the big names that we have. I'm sure you might recognize some of these big insurance companies like New York Life, Mass Mutual, things you see on television. It has taken 20 years to accumulate this type of uh, customer base. And today we've got about $1.5 billion of insurance premium running through our platform and about $16 billion of annuity premium uh, running through it. That was not an overnight success. 20 years of convincing people day in, day out, there was a better way to do things electronically in a very paper-tensive paper, uh, based uh, industry. Today we're in Exton, Pennsylvania. We have 500 employees. We have nine offices in the US. We have offices in Japan. Uh, outside of London, uh, Canada, and we've become a global company. And uh, I'm excited that the company is in a position that it, if it wants to, it could go public. Uh, but right now, we're just choosing to keep continue to grow the company, you know, 20% growth rate year over year. We have a 97% retention in the subscription. Think of that like a Wall Street Journal. Every single month, you have to pay us for this content because the content's always changing and people don't unhook from us. It's like the mob, right? We'll get to <laughs> So let's talk about living your dream and some things that I've sort of discovered along the way um, uh, as an entrepreneur myself. Ultimately, there's 14 things that we can talk about, and, and you guys can interrupt me and ask any questions you want as we go through this. First of all, everything always starts with an idea. It doesn't have to be your idea. In fact, I would love to go work on somebody else's idea so you don't have all the pressure at this point. So if you can find somebody that you've got talent and you could add to their idea and you can get stock options and go from there, a lot of people have made a lot of money, a lot of millions of dollars off of other people's ideas. But if you have your own idea, that's great. But you may need some people in this room or other people outside this room to help you because you can't do everything well. An admission that's really hard for all of us is what we suck at, right? Mm -hmm. It's your blind spots, what you can't see. And other people come and say, hey, you're really not good at that. You go, I'm good at that. No, you're not good at that. There's other people that are way better at things and learn to use other people to get your idea moving faster. Then ultimately, you take this idea and you want to go out and validate it. Validation usually occurs from people who have the problem that you sort of think you're solving. Everything starts with a problem. If you go talk to your mom about your problem or your best friend about your problem and they don't resonate because they don't have the problem, then you don't know whether you're validating your problem. You've got to find 
in my case, insurance agents that have the same problem, distributors, people that were frustrated with things. So whatever that idea is, make sure that you target market specifically people that have the problem because it'll be the raw feedback that you're going to need to, to be able to find out whether it's a really good idea or not. <clears throat> then I want you to hone it. Hone it is a lot of times I will go out and uh, present something over and over again four or five times internally to my own employees, uh, sometimes the outside world, and find out whether this message is actually landing. You look at their faces, you go, oh, I don't think they know what I meant by that. Uh, you think you're explaining it properly, and the reality is you're not. You're too complicated, you have too many words, you've got too much stuff on the screen, they're not concise. And people, when you start to hone that in, will tell you, I don't know what you mean. And, you, and the tighter um, you can get it, the better. More successful people take words out of things, not words in. So make your stuff really clean and powerful to, to the degree you can. And then I want you to prototype it. Um, there are so many tools today that allow you to fake it till you make it. Um, and I'm not just talking about PowerPoint. You know, you can use um, just in mind things when you click a button, it actually goes somewhere and, and looks like the next screen comes up. And people, if I can fake people out looking at prototypes that they actually think it's a real product, then I've done my job. That don't mean you don't put in Batman as the name, you know, as, a, as a, something you want to type in there. So it gives away your secret that this is just a mock-up. Make it look as exactly as real as you can so that everybody says, well, is that because it makes it look like that's, I could buy it today but allows you to visually show what the flow is to people and explain your idea in a way that they can actually see it on the screen, okay? Show and tell. You gotta go out and show this stuff and you gotta get on the court. There was a guy that I used to work with, he said, Bill, you can sit in the stands and tie your shoelaces all day and you get your jersey all right, or you can get on the court and we'll figure it out when we get out there. You're never gonna feel that it's time to go out and show and tell and everything's perfect. You just gotta get on the court. Right? So if you go out there half-baked, that's okay. You can tell people that's where you're at, but you're going to discover things on the court that you can't figure out when you're in the stands. So just jump in there and get, get moving on it. And don't, don't worry about making everything so perfect in life. But ultimately, the people that you want to show and tell are the people that you went to go get the feedback and the prototype from. These are the people that you believe are most likely are going to pay for your service. And I said pay because some of your ideas may be to give things away and then you'll get advertising around it, but ultimately someone's going to pay for your product, or if you don't have revenue, you're not going to sell this thing or be able to achieve anything going forward. But you really need to focus on, on those folks that would pay. So an example of this is I went to someone who had the biggest problem that I, that I had and got them so excited about the idea, they ultimately funded the company, right, and then allowed us to be able to move forward with that. Um, again, wasting time with mom, she'll, she'll pat you on the back and tell you how great you are and won't tell you the truth, but you got to find the people that will and the people will pay. If no one's willing to pay, you don't have a good idea, okay? Then once you get that, you wanna go back and refine it. Refining is difficult because most of us think we came up with the perfect pitch, the perfect idea, and then somebody goes out and kicks your ass at the idea, and then you gotta come back and put your tail between your legs and redo it again. That's fine, that's exactly what you need. But you gotta not give up. You have to be able to tweak it, change the message, change the name of the company, change the name of the product, whatever you have to do, don't give up on it, but refining, uh, is critical for you to go through this process uh, to get to the other side. Repitch it. A lot of people go out and show their stuff to folks, and then there's no close, there's no event, there's no, you, they don't know what you're asking for. Like, oh, look, I can screw this on the top, and then that cool, and that's my idea, and they're like, okay, that's, but what do you want? You basically have to ask, do you want money? Do you want my time? Do you want my expertise? Do you need uh, access to my client base? Do you need systems? Do you need marketing? What is your ask from me as you tell me this? Because there has to be a closing event. Most of us as entrepreneurs forget we have to close, right? Always be closing somebody, either for money or for ideas or thoughts. Can I use your office? Can I borrow your computer? Whatever you're doing all along the way, make sure that that pitch, ultimately, that you're asking for something in there. And then I want you to create a, a sense of urgency. I can't tell you that even 20 years from now, we invent products today and I go out and I'm pitching a product right now to, to customers who, who know who we are, but they're like, well, how many people are using it? How many agents are doing that? None. Well, you know, how do you get that butterfly to fly when, when you're trying to, to make something work? You create a sense of urgency by telling people that I've showed this to five people this week and four almost fell off their chair. And here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna give one of these away by Friday but I'm gonna to need to hear from you Friday at two o'clock or you're gonna be off the table. 
So you've got to create something that has a, a definitive date or some time period that you're willing to make some concession to get something rolling because you need a reference account. Even if you gave it away for free, because I've done that, I was over in Europe last week, and I said, I'm going to give this away to two insurance companies. I have 10 appointments this week. I only had five, all right? 10 appointments this week. I've already saw two. They're going to go to the board of directors next week, but I'm here to find out by Friday before I get on the airplane, you can decide whether you want to be one of them. Phone rings. I want to be one of them, right? All that was fictitious. I'm not saying go out and lie, but you can go out and make this sense of urgency to get your stuff rolling because you need to get somebody on board to say, well, is anybody else using it? You go, yeah, that person. Right? Everybody always wants to hear reference accounts. Fail cheap, fail fast. Don't go out and spend a lot of money. Right? You can do a lot of stuff on the back of a napkin. Right? Do not go in your personal savings account, convince your wife to leverage your house, and go build something that's crazy. Okay? Think about phase one, phase two, phase three. In phase one, you can show people what your vision is and your roadmap and what phase three is going to look like, but we're going to bite off a small little piece and do phase one so you're not hanging out there flapping in the wind, okay? And you want to just move off this idea and move to your next idea. Most of you have a ton of ideas, right? Move them, move them, move them, and don't spend a lot of money when you do that. Barring, be careful what you do on this side. I learned a long, a tough lesson on this. Um, Venture capital is different than borrowing money from your mom and dad or borrowing money from a bank. You borrow money from a bank and it doesn't work, the bank wants their money back. I borrowed $2 million and iPlay Plan 1999 was going down the crapper with all the dot coms, right? It was in bad shape. And I was like, well, didn't work, the idea, and you know, I'll just walk away from that bank loan. Oh, but they have my house as collateral, right? So if I ever sell the house, it's theirs. But more importantly, when you um, get a forgiveness of debt because you walked away from it, the government says that is a income to you. So $2 million in income, you owe $800,000 in taxes, you owe that April 15th, you're like, holy shit, <laughs> right? You had no idea that this little idea you talked about, somebody didn't tell you about borrowing money is different from venture capital, right? So if you're gonna go do it, try to bootstrap it yourself, but before you go collateralize your home or borrow something from your parents or, your, or somebody, it's, it's some, for somebody to write that debt off, you have to take it as income. And to have the IRS chase me down for the next 20 years for $800,000 garnishing my wages, and, you know, being 27, you're like, you know, I'm 49 now, you're like, that kid was an idiot, right? <laughs> you got to be really careful on that. Say it again? Um, you can go to family and friends and wealthy types of private people, and they know that what they're doing is they're getting a piece of your company, some shares in your company, for trade-off for the risk of the money they're going to lend you. But if it doesn't work out, you don't owe them back, and you don't have forgiveness of debt or income off that. So what you want to do is you take your idea, incorporate it, get some shares, and then figure out what the value of that company is. And there's some things online you can go and figure out the value of a, of a company and then figure out what percentage you would like to sell to that investor for the, for the money that you need to, to capitalize it. But it's way different than going to the bank and borrowing money. Bank will give you money if you have a house in equity. They don't care what your idea is. They just want it back when, you, when you're done with it. Don't screw it around. Business plans. I don't have to explain to you what a business plan is. Google it. What I will tell you about a business plan is they suck. They suck to make, they suck to think through it, to put all that kind of stuff. And it's almost like my kid who's uh, in geometry class, like, that. I'm never going to use geometry, right? This is a way to weed out all the riffraff. If you're too lazy to put this together, they know that you don't have an idea that you're willing to work hard on that stuff. So when they say, do you have a business plan? You're like, yeah, it is. You're like, wow, I actually got through the, that big hurdle, right? To sit down and write through how I'm going to get revenue and how I'm going to start and all those things you have to think about, nobody likes to do that, right? Find somebody that can help you. But this is really an entry point. It's almost like you can't go to college with a high school degree. You can't get anybody to listen to your idea unless you at least put that together. Now, I'm not saying you go out and build a business plan off your idea. I told you, go out and validate it, make sure there's something there, and then put that together. But you can put together a one or two page outline about what the idea is and how you're going to go to market, uh, real simplistic, and then decide to get into the 10 page business plan at a later date. Okay? Dressable market. A lot of times we all come up with good ideas and we think that this idea is great, but we never have any idea how big the idea can be, right? So I'm in the loft of my house thinking about this insurance thing, but have no idea that this could be a global company, right? 
it was bigger than I thought it was. But uh, I saw a Shark Tank the other day, and uh, this guy had this little jack that you could put your foot on and jacked up a table and kept it level. And I remember Mark Cuban said to him, how many restaurants are there in America? And he's like, I think there's like 10 million. How many tables are in actually in a restaurant on average? I think there's 10. And they go, okay, there's 100 million tables. You go, how many of them wobble? About 10%. You go, okay, there's, so there's 10 million tables. You go, what's your device cost? He goes, two bucks. You go, so you have a $20 million business idea. Like that quick, right? He's like, I'm out. So a lot of times you go, well, what's wrong with $20 million? Well, it depends. I mean, you could sell that for a lot, but if the ID is really, really, really big and can be as big as you can make it, then venture capital people come in and they want to know how big is this total addressable market. We have venture capital. We've raised $100 million, bucks, $100 million and, and they all come in and say, okay, what's the IT spend globally? We're like $2.4 trillion. They're like, okay, if we can get 1% of that, we're in good shape, right? Think about that in your business plan because you enter in so many ideas that come along that doesn't have any scale. When I started iPipeline, if we had a $500,000 idea, this was big time. Right now, I can't even tell you anything that can be less than 10 to $20 million idea because nobody cares. We've got to be able to move the needle from 100 million to 200 million and moving something half a million bucks isn't going to do it anymore. But when you're smaller, it seems to be okay. But think about the total addressable market um, through that process. Listen, at the end of the day, don't quit your day job off this idea, okay? There's ways for you to be able to work an idea and work something in your spare time. I worked for four years for iPipeline and did not take any salary. And I sold insurance at night and worked at iPipeline during the day. The insurance at night paid all the bills, right? I didn't let go of that monkey bar until I knew there was something over there that had referenceable counts and there was an idea. If you just jump out there and say, hey, I'm out here, Jerry, all of a sudden doesn't work. You've got a lot of risks. Some of them are younger, some of them are mid-age, some are older. Um, you know, make sure that you have some type of safety net while you're going through this process until you're convinced that, that that's going on. Okay. Um, at the end of the day, there was a guy, uh, Captain Cortez. Anybody know about the story about burning of the ships? So in, I think, 15, uh, 19, who was the captain of the Spanish Armada, and they were going to go attack the Aztecs. Um, who had been in power for 600 years, lands on the, the beach with about 500 soldiers, soldiers. They're outnumbered 10 to 1. And he orders the officers to turn around and light the ships on fire. And they're like, what are you, nuts? I mean, how, how are we going to get out of here? How are we going to escape? And he said, you're not. You have no choice. You have to win, right? So at the end of the day, when you have the ability to retreat and you have the option to retreat, you never really commit to anything. Now, I'm not saying at one stage, don't quit your job, but when you're about to quit your job, put everything in, in that you have. Turn around light your ships on fire. Ultimately, whether it's relationships or whether it's your business or whatever it is, you've got to be able to fully commit to what you're doing. And if you leave yourself, well, I can always go with my mom and I can always go do that. And I can, they're nice escape hatches, but you'll always have that back in your head. You're not actually fully in it. When iPipeline was going under in 1999, I owe $800,000 in taxes where my ships burnt, Absolutely. My house was wiped out. My wife would probably be like, see it. That was a dumb mistake, right? Everything's in the line. Until you get to that point, you don't fight very hard. I think there was a, Sin Tzu wrote a, the Art of War. It's put a man on death ground and he fights like no other. When you know you're going to die, it's, it's, you know, you go off, when those, when those uh, ships land on World War II and they put those things down and, on Omaha Beach and they knew they were dying, right? You're going to fight really hard, and probably I didn't fight it hard enough for iPipe by 99 until I knew it was going under. Turn around, light those ships on fire, and, and uh, you ultimately will. will uh, it's amazing what you'll tree, achieve if you just commit to it. Okay? So, that was a quick one. I don't like to stand here and bore the heck out of you, and I'll just rather just take some questions if you guys have them. I don't All know right, if I can answer them. That was awesome. <laughs> I don't be depressing. Before you flatterize your home? <laughs> no, I didn't do that, but I didn't tell before my wife when I tried to leave something. Yeah, yeah. I didn't tell her either. <laughs> I like the burn the ships thing, though. Really, you, you, can't, you can't look back. There's like one option. Uh, someone said that to me recently. So, house rules uh, introduce yourself really briefly in like haiku format, and then your question. So, who's first? Uh, my name is Kate Ward, and uh, just uh, curious, what was 
the tipping point for you when you, you started going out there and marketing this? When did you really start gaining traction? Was there anything that really uh, catalyzed that? Um, I would say it was three or four years into it when I was standing in a booth and we were uh, selling and people started to buy this thing. We started getting subscription. We didn't have enough to pay me, but there were revenue and there was customers and we needed support. And you start thinking, well, if I put all my energy into this, what could it possibly be? So I don't think the tipping point comes until people start nodding their head and write checks at, at the ultimate. And you can run around like a gerbil all day long and kid yourself that you've got a business because you're working hard. But I think the checks is what matters. Um, Kyle Hudson, Wall Street Labs. Um, you said that you're not really a technical person. So how did you get this idea off? Like how big was your starting team? And how did you choose that? Started off with two people, three people. One, my first employee was my mom because she was cheap and she, she said, I'll come work for you for free, right? <laughs> Second was a, was a guy that was a technical person that explained to me what this cloud was, which they didn't use those words back then, but the internet. And uh, there was um, things that we could do to take this computer, talk to that computer, and I was like, well, well, well how, how would that work? And, but I was more uh, interested in actually what the problem was, how to solve the problem, and the internet was a way to do that you know, without having all that footprint behind it. So um, that, was a, that was a team. Then we had to hire some customer support people. As the revenue started to come, the phones started to ring, so we needed to get people to, to uh, answer the phones. I was the lead sales guy. I was the only person that went out and sold probably the first 10 years. We did not have a salesperson um, available. And I learned that when I sat in front of a room, I was always so afraid that um, someone was going to find out that I was the founder of a software company, but I didn't know anything about technology. So they'd say like this, they go, okay, I question, they go, is that on .NET, are you using Bootstrap? They're like, what? I don't know what you're talking about. And then they go, you're a fraud, right? The flip side is if I was just this insurance agent, then like, well, how are they going to get this technology business going, right? So I learned to shift the audience and to talk about what I knew, and I'd say, I'm not going to talk about that. So here's how to do that. I would say, um, someone once asked me if I was born wearing yellow glasses, what color would I see the world? I said, I'd see the world as yellow. They said, no, you'd see the world as normal because you wouldn't know any other color. My world is from an insurance agent's perspective. So today, my job is to get you to see yellow, which means we're not talking about purple and blue and green and, and all, the, all the technical things and marketing and operations because at the end of the day, to get someone to use your software, you have to think yellow, you have to see yellow. Do we all agree we're just going to talk about yellow today? And then I would not stay away from all the technical questions. And when someone said, well, Bill, is that? I go, that's not yellow. Right? And then I would wait till I learn the technology. I get back and go, what do you mean by that? And then explain it. So you don't need to know everything. You just need to find the people that either understand the industry, the problem, or the technology that's going to solve that. And today I walk around the office and there's so many people that do so many things that I don't have to do this anymore. And um, you know, it takes a while to get there. Did that answer your question? Yes, it did. We just uh, finished an event with Unisys. Uh, it was a prototyping event. and. Hackathons are everywhere, and they came to us and kind of told us about their problem. They don't have a front end for their product, and I turned to Peter and I said, it sounds like they won a prototyping competition. I've never heard of that. But my background is in like product development, not really engineering. And he said, well, I, I heard one of my friends just got back and just did it, and I said to myself, well, at least one person has done this. And Let's do it with Unisys. And we had, we expected maybe four teams, 15 people. We got 80, over 80 people, 20 teams competing to get in and like try their hand to come up with products. It was so awesome. Uh, I love that you, you broached that in a, a bunch of different ways. The innovation isn't just the software folks, it's a domain expert. You can fake it through all those tools. So we have uh, Innovation Day. Once a quarter at iPipeline, you're allowed to take the day off from work on Friday. The only requirement is that on Monday you have to come back and present to the executive team what your idea was. We don't care what it is. Nobody has to vet what your idea is. Teams are between five and seven people. They do exactly what you just mentioned. And they're amazing the ideas they come up with. And then we try to filter the, the best ones to the top. We have a hackathon next, next Friday where we're given um, probably more of the engineer guys uh, wearables, like all kinds of different wearables. We'll say, listen, we're in the insurance space. How do we take wearables and make it applicable to our software? We have no idea what they're going to come up with, right? So it's not just the founder's responsibility to come up with ideas. Um, you get everybody involved. Um, I sit with a lot of kids that are 25, our average age is 
um, people in our office are around 31, 32 years old, right? So I sit with a lot of kids that are 25, 22 years old, and I'll tell them what my idea, and they're like, can I just work on that idea and come back to you and say that, you know, I'm like, wow, that's pretty cool, but I would move that over here and do that. So sometimes you can't think about what it looks like unless you get other people involved in these, these, these hackathons, which is cool. That's what's cool about this place. Yeah, and this came out of that program through Bob Burns. Uh, he submitted this idea to get you here and kind of work with us. Yeah. So, did you have a question about that? Um, it seems very obvious to me that you have a lot of experience over a variety of years and kind of changes throughout technology. Um, uh, Accordingly, so, um, and I, it was really nice to hear all these um, pieces of input uh, or suggestions for people who are prospective entrepreneurs or maybe current entrepreneurs. Um, maybe you could share with us some anecdotes um, to some of these talking points. Um, more specifically, would you mind sharing with us a time when you um, had a business plan or an idea in your mind uh, that you were really certain uh, was going to succeed and it was shot down? Um, and maybe kind of the process of rebuilding or reiterating that idea? Mm -hmm. So, um the way that I got this butterfly to work is I went to an insurance company and said, if you give me all of your content, I'll distribute it out to these distributors in a multi-carrier platform. And they would say, well, how many distributors do you have? I go, I got none because you haven't given me any of the content. <laughs> then I went over to the distributors. I go, wouldn't it be cool if you had all the insurance companies in one place on the internet? You wouldn't have that filing cabinet. I go, that'd be awesome. How many carriers do you have? I go, none. Right. So this whole chicken or egg just took 10 years. I, I think of it like Comcast just digging up people's front yards and laying wire in there. Like, what are they doing? I go, I don't know, digging up front yards. But now we have like a set top, and you got like HBO, and you got security and internet, and those all kinds of things. But um, so it was this chicken or egg. So the way I solved it is I told insurance companies, I'll tell you what, I'll give this to you for free. Put your content in there, and then I'll go out and sign the distributors up. And I'll prove to you that that's what they want. And I sold it to the subscription distributors. When I got two, 300 distributors, I went back to the insurance company and said, okay, I'm gonna charge them now to be in our platform. So I remember the first day I walked into the CEO of a big insurance company in Baltimore and I said, look, I've been giving this to you for free for four years. And um, I need to charge you $100,000 to be inside the subscription. He called security and had me thrown out of the door. <laughs> Escort. He didn't talk to me. He said, get the F out. And he called security right there and threw me out of the building. So I got to the parking lot. And I go, well, that idea's not going to work. <laughs> and I drove home from Baltimore going, oh, my God, what did I just do? I, so, but I only had one, I had one flap of a butterfly. It just turned like this the rest of the year. You know what I mean? Like I only had the distributor. I had to get these insurance companies. So staying you know, on that, you know, get your ass kicked the first time you try it, you just can't give up, and ultimately, I got those 150 insurance companies to pay us enormous subscriptions. Some pay us five million dollars a year now in subscription, and that just takes some time. So that might be an example where you, you <laughs> think it's not going to work. <laughs> to uh, Janelle and Chad, and then uh, well, Janelle Snyder, founder of Snyder Law, and I, I don't know what color these glasses are, but the salesman glasses. What kind of tips do you have on selling? Like an intangible product, I guess is what it is. Yeah, I love intangible products because you can invent whatever you want to say, right? If you don't like it that way, if you have a pen, like, that's all it does. You're like, so you got to find people that um, have experience in selling intangible products. Are you looking for a salesperson or are you trying to understand how you sell an intangible? I am a salesperson at my company okay. right now, so tips you have as far as what are the best kind of key elements that have worked for you? I like to get things visually, uh, take, take whatever the intangible thing is, and paint a story. So I like a beginning, middle, and end. Whether it's start with catch it, then we're going to talk about high fly and then we're going to talk about this, and we're going to end. It has to be a complete story to me. And people don't really write out the story, especially when it's intangible. So people put their heads up and they're like, okay, I'm following you, because you can't see it. Sure, it's you can't touch and see, right? It's very hard to sell it. I sold most of those insurance policies, those 6,000 over the phone, so now you couldn't even see me. So picture an intangible and not even seeing me, right? It's very hard. So you gotta be really good at communicating, and you have to have a story, and you have to have your words picked out. So I used to write the words down a short amount so I could say it, and I would practice, 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 practice. So I could say it over the phone, over the web, through WebEx. And if you can do that, then you can go out and paint a picture. And then a lot of times you might not have the ability to, you know, to, to, to show something visually, so you have to be able to talk that story. So I have to know all those points with this thing. When we started off and the focus machine wasn't working, I'm like, this will be the day the ball doesn't work, right? Well, now you gotta know the story really well. But um, 
it's probably the hardest thing you'll do is take an intangible product, learn to sell it, and if you're selling it over the phone or over the web, I think stories help people to grasp it. Okay. Okay, Chad. Uh, Chad Munger, uh, head school team. Um, what, I just want a little bit more information about your product, but what happened in that situation? Um, did you, with your client there, did you cut them off? Did you keep them going and come back later on with something else? I mean, how do you handle a situation where someone back your told bluff? Right? I, I think he, when he called the bluff, he was a large insurance company and knew that I couldn't really afford to take him out. It's so almost like saying, tell them yeah. HBO, we're going to take you off the, the cable box. Yeah. Yeah. He had more power than I did. So I let him stay on the platform, but, was, but I, I uh, boxed out some, some content that he couldn't get to. It made it a little difficult without losing him as a customer. But I went and sold all the little guys first. So when now instead of going after the big giants, when I'm told the little guys, oh, you want on the platform? And, and we maybe had 60 insurance companies then, that, that allow us to, to, to add those. And then once we had enough momentum revenue side on the smaller guys, we would go back to the bigger guys and say, uh, listen, there's a thing called cons a contract, and contracts have to have consideration, you know that. So I cannot have a contract with you that says you'll keep my content current and accurate when I have all these people looking at it from a, from a reliability standpoint when we don't even have a relationship contractually. So can we get this as a contractual relationship? They go, sure, and I go, well, I'm going to have to charge you for that because a contract doesn't need any validation if you, you pay. So some people pay 5000 some people pay 25000 some people have 50000 and then we had all different levels of paying, which was, was a nightmare. But ultimately, when you got them to pay, then you start to raise the rates every year. And we, every year, we go back and take those guys that were burdened from years and we keep bringing them out. So now we've normalized everybody. Because we go, this is just not fair anymore for you to pay differently than them and then them. So we, we were able to get it. But that takes, takes a lot of years. So I don't know that you just throw people out. You have to decide whether they have more power than you do. A lot of people have more power than me. Now we have more, we have all the power, and you just have to wheel that now nicely. So that people do the opposite. They go, oh, they're arrogant. They're this, they're this, and they want out of the platform. You gotta keep that butterfly flapping. Can I, can I talk? <laughs> yeah, this would have been a great talk to the uh, the recent events and this is prototype. I, mean, I think it fits right in with that approach because almost everything he said so far has been about doing moderate steps, iterative steps in a process to kind of get you there eventually. Almost everything you said, even in your development, your business plan, how you're handling that problem there, was about incremental approaches to everything. I think that's really interesting. Yeah, yeah. we put we put 300,000 PDF forms in a library and put them all in one spot. No one never done that before, right? Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, we look back a couple years and we have 17 million forms downloaded out of our platform on an annual basis. That means agents are printing them and handwriting them. So we were able to convince the world that if there were 17 million forms downloaded, what if we change all the forms to it to be like a TurboTax and you could fill it out electronically? They go, well, how would we know people would use it? They go, well, there's 17 million of, you know, over here. So iteratively, it's easy to get people to that next visual step. If you walk in there day one and say, I'd like to build a TurboTax for uh, forms, they were like, you're out of your mind. Couldn't even download them at the time. So you gotta figure out what that, that step is. I guarantee no matter what you start off with, you will not be doing the same thing three years from now. We all go in with these plans, and you've gotta be flexible enough to change that and then you know, do, do an iterative step. All right, uh, Joanne, actually. Uh, Joanne, about Wong. So I have a question. You have a title that's found on Chief Strategy Officer. So I'm really interested when you made what changes and why? So we took about uh, 20 million in our first round of capital. And at that moment, VCs want to insert their CEO. So uh, I, I just accepted uh, last Thursday, Mar was there, the technology, um, what was the technology? The PAC award. Technology oh, company of the award, yeah, yeah right? Huh? And one of my speeches was that you typically don't see a founder and a CEO coexisting under the same roof, mostly because the founder gets their feelings hurt and they think that somebody's messing with their vision and changing things and they just leave and that, you know, they left. So big step is when you decide that you need a, a management team that can actually scale the company, that the VCs say, hey, I'm gonna put money in, this is a bigger, big enough idea that I'm gonna fund it. And then other people start to show up. Uh, marketing department, operations, a CFO, a CEO, right? You start hiring people that run customer service, and then people start carving out departments, professional services. Um, and then you have to decide 
well, what, what role am I going to take? Because you know, if you're the only person with the idea, you're product management, you're the sales guy, you're everything, and things, you know, people start coming in, they go, I got that bill, I got that bill, I got that, I got that. And you start getting paranoid, like, what do I got? Right? So today, my job is the strategize uh, globally on the company where it's going and a product strategy. But one of my things that I do most for the company is do exactly what I'm doing right now. Four, five, six hundred thousand people where I speak. And I'm on the face of iPipeline from a, from a logo standpoint. And it's nice that it's the founder doing it, not just somebody or the person. Like that. Usually it happens when there's this moment of infusion of cash where you now can scale and hire these people. And your VCs want to put them in place. You have an excellent management team. I think your team is phenomenal. Yeah, I've been we, watching them for a while. But we, it took us four or five years to like each other. <laughs> <laughs> we had therapists come in. We, had, we, still, we, we still have an executive coach that comes in every quarter, and we'd sit down, and we'd all go, "Well, you know, he's not doing that." And we blame each other, and then after a while, you just start going, "You know what? You have your strengths, you have your weaknesses, and once you realize what those strengths and weaknesses are, those blind spots, and you admit to them, then everybody can help you." Like I couldn't write a business plan in my life dependent upon it, right? I just don't like typing in that because I explain it to you. So you need to get somebody that can write it down for you. Right? There's people in my company that would hate to. I'll, I'll go. I'll go talk to Wall Street. I got that. And they go, thank you. Like so, you hand off uh, to each other what your skill sets are. That's great to know that stuff like that happens or exists. It's like that Metallica uh, documentary where they were breaking up and they they hired a therapist to kind of coach them into their <laughs> second company. Yeah. They did a movie about it. We've been there six years. It comes every quarter with you therapy. It's good though. All right, we got a couple of minutes left. I mean, I'm Rob Julius, I'm with Splash Club. Um, as a founder, you obviously <coughs> had some sort of idea of what your culture for the company would be right, from the beginning stages. And how has that changed to where you are now, 500 people? How did you guys navigate that change? Ironically, the CEO had the same cultural uh, vision as I did. And we actually wrote our culture down on paper. Like what type of people we want to hire. Um, we, we actually have these cards that sit out on our desks of, of, of uh, respect. Um, you know, we want to have fun. We had, the culture has always been loose. We bust on each other. I could be coming to meet with 500 people and busting the CEO. I had, a, had his face put on a bass fish the other day when we were doing the presentation. And you got to be able to take yourself. You know, I told a story when we were doing an exception speech about how I hooked the boss right in the face when I was shrimp and a hook when I was fishing. I cast back and him right in the face and I believe it was the first day I knew him. So, like, <laughs> so like you, we, we just have that fun. We do cookouts, we do bowling teams, golf, baseball teams, softball. We have uh, Cinco de Mayo parties. We just keep it really loose and fun and energetic and that, that really hasn't changed much. We hired people that were fit in that culture versus hiring people who then try to change your culture. I think it's the hiring that's the key to that. And they understand fully what your culture is when they're walking through it. Okay. I'm Seal Sculper with Imagine Technologies. And you were talking a little bit about how you incremented product and suddenly realized that you had a global product. But also, it looks like you started with life insurance, you added annuities. What has the healthcare change done for you? And what doors has that opened? Well, I learned that we don't know anything about health insurance, <laughs> and it's very, very competitive. So the question is, can we sell life insurance and annuities inside health exchanges? So we believe, and we know, because of Obamacare, 40 million Americans like us will go in and buy insurance at our employer uh, in, in a benefits mall or on, on, on an exchange, right? And we all, in December, sign up, and uh, we have about seven minutes to, to, to go through our process. But nowhere in there, they ask you about your dental and your family and your health, and then they ask you about life insurance. And uh, we want to be the platform that sits inside those employer sites so that when you come into your site, we already know whether you're married, your income, you know if you're kids, we've already made a recommendation, we already put through an algorithm and said this is how much insurance you need, and the number's on the screen, and you can tap a button. Now because the insurance industry has all this paper and it takes you know, 20 minutes to fill an application. I don't have 20 minutes to, to bring you through that process. So the world right now is shifting in this insurance space to predictive analytics or predictive underwriting. They're hitting algorithms of people like LexisNexis. They know your bankruptcy. They know your children. They know your side of your house. They know all those types. They run through an algorithm. They make a decision about you from a learning standpoint at $500,000 a globe right on the screen. So if we bring you into those health exchanges, 
we know your name, we know everything, we just go, you want to buy that, yes or no. And your employer is going to give you $10,000, it's a defined uh, contribution, not defined benefit, because the costs are skyrocketing. And you'll walk through the mall and you'll spend your, your qualified money on whatever you want. And we think one of those things will be insurance. So here's the shift that we're trying to serve. There's a company called Zenef Zenefits, anybody know that? Yeah. Benefits of those. Yeah. So they got a $4.5 billion valuation of the same revenue on pipeline has, right? But what's the difference is they take the commissions from the insurance. So do we want to be the software company that powers that platform, or do we want to be a software company that also takes the commission? Because if I have commission, and there's $20 billion commission paid a year, and I pipeline could be the global clearinghouse for insurance. We now do insurance, and we have another flat to the butterfly called insurance commission, and our valuations go, and the public numbers go really high, too. Did I answer your question? Yes, it does. Or let's make it that the last question. Okay. Thanks. Uh, I'm Rich Saban, I'm the founder of Mindset. Um, good question about the insurance business. Uh, do you see the insurance agents sort of going away at some point and people just buying insurance from portals like these directly from insurance companies? You're asking insurance agents the question. <laughs> um, a percentage of the in industry will buy insurance without an without agent. So clearly this is an example where we believe you can do that. But a certain threshold and above, you just because the products are so complicated, annuities, and you're just going to need to have an, an intermediary or an advisor. The challenge is that our insurance agents are 57 years old. They're, they're not bringing new blood to business. When I was in college, the Prudential would come to your campus and recruit you. That doesn't happen anymore. So who's going to sell insurance in the future is these uh, wealth planners, Morgan Stanley, you know, the Edward Jones of the world, who are doing your financial planning. They don't understand the complexity of insurance either. So the products are going to get more vanilla, more simplest these guys can sell. They'll be sold by agents at a higher level, and then consumers will buy things uh, more direct um, from the standpoint. But what you don't know is there's 1,500 distributors out there who take 40% cuts of every insurance agent in America. They're the middlemen. We think they're going away. That's what Zenefits figured out, too. It's like you've got to get, and that's $3 billion of comp just in the United States. Well, Pipeline could be a clearinghouse, a digital clearinghouse as well. So agent stays, distributor leaves, and that gets bifurcated by size of face amount. Okay. Well, what's, uh, what's interesting, I jumped on the Zenefits uh, wagon really early on, but after being with them for almost a year, I ditched them for a human being because I couldn't, I didn't, I, I didn't feel like a relationship anyone was caring for the whole. So I don't know if that's indicative of what could yeah. happen. At certain, at certain levels, you'll be willing to deal without a human, at certain volumes, you'll want a human. And by the way, I think this is amazing that you guys are actually here. I mean, just to learn from people, learning from each other, find out what's in the outside world. I mean, to, to go out and try to figure out and solve problems and to, to take risks, that's, that's very commendable. And you guys ought to be happy that uh, at least you're taking the shots. It's not going to work out for everybody, but you'll learn a lot about yourself. Uh, you may work for somebody else. You may discover it on your own. But you know, the, all the good ideas are not gone. Somebody said to me, well, there's not going to be any more Googles in the world. That's not true. We've got Uber. We've got taking a car. Like, who would have thought that, that that's sharing a ride with somebody would have been a billion dollar, multi billion dollar idea? Yeah. It could be sitting right in this room. And like I said, I didn't think 20 years ago I could get to where, where it happened. You just sort of accidentally fall into it. A lot of hard work. But you don't have to have all the answers sitting here today. Okay? All right, thanks a lot for coming.